Chapter 5 of Inspector French and the Shane Mystery by Freeman Wills Crofts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Atul Sharma, Winnipeg, Canada. An Amateur Sleuth. Shane's great idea was that instead of proceeding directly to the police station and lodging an information against his captors, as he had at first intended, he should himself attempt to follow them to their lair. To enter upon a battle of wits with such men would be a sport more thrilling than big game hunting, more exciting than war. And if by his own unaided efforts he could bring about their undoing, he would not only restore his self-respect, which had suffered a nasty jar, but might even recover for Arnold Price the documents which he had required for his claim to the barony of Hull. Whether he was wise in his decision was another matter, but with Maxwell Shane, impulse ruled rather than colder reason, the desire of the moment rather than adherence to calculated plan. Therefore, directly a way in which he could begin the struggle occurred to him. He was all eagerness to set about carrying it out. The essence of his plan was haste, and he therefore bent lustily to his oars, sending the tiny craft bounding over the wavelets of the estuary, and leaving a wake of bubbles from its foaming stern. In a few minutes he had reached the shore immediately beneath Warren Lodge, tied the painter round a convenient boulder, and racing over the rocky beach, had set off running towards the house. It was a short, though stiff climb, but he did not spare himself, and he reached the garden wall within three minutes of leaving the boat. As he turned in through the gate, he looked back over the panorama of sea, the whole expanse of which was visible from this point, measuring with his eye the distance to inner forward point, the headland at the opposite side of the bay, around which the Enid had just disappeared. She was going east, up channel, but he did not think she was traveling fast enough to defeat his plans. Another minute brought him to the house, and there, in less time than it takes to tell, he had seen his sister, explained that he might not be back that night, obtained some money, donned his leggings and waterproof, and starting up his motorbike, had set off to ride into Dartmouth. Pausing for a moment at the boat slip to tell Johnson of the whereabouts of his dinghy, he reached the ferry and got across the river to Kingswear with the minimum of delay possible. Then, once more mounting his machine, he rode rapidly off towards the east. The land lying eastward of Dartmouth forms a peninsula, shaped roughly like an inverted cone, truncated and connected to the mainland by a broad isthmus of the northwest corner. The west side is bounded by the river Dart, with Dartmouth and Kingswear to the southwest, while on the other three sides is the sea. Brixham is a small town at the northeast corner, while further north beyond the isthmus are the larger towns of Paynton and across Torbay, Torquay. Most of the ground on the peninsula is high, and the road from Kingswear in the southwest corner to Brixham in the northeast crosses a range of hills from which a good view of Tor Bay and the sea to the north and east is obtainable. Should the Enid have been bound for Torquay, Tainmouth, Exmouth, or any of the seaports close by, she would pass within view of this road, whereas if she was going right up channel, past Portland Bill, she would go nearly due east from the froward points, Shane's hope was that he should reach this viewpoint before she would have had time to get out of sight, had she been on the former course, so that her presence or absence would indicate the route she was pursuing. But when, having reached the place, he found that no trace of the Enid was to be seen, he realized that he had made a mistake. From inner forward point to Brixham was only about seven miles, to Payton about ten, and to Torquay eleven or twelve. The longest of these distances the launch should do in about twenty-five minutes, and as in spite of all his haste no less than forty-seven minutes had elapsed since he stepped into the dinghy, the test was evidently useless. But having come so far, he was not going to turn back without making some further effort. The afternoon was still young, the day was fine, he had had his lunch and cycling was pleasant, 
he would ride along the coast and make some inquiries. He dropped down the hill into Brixham, and turning to the left, pulled up at the little harbour. A glance showed him that the Enid was not there. He therefore turned his machine, and starting once more, ran the five miles odd to Payton, at something well above the legal limit. Inquiries at the pier produced no result, but as he turned away, he had a stroke of unexpected luck. Meeting a coast guard, he stopped and questioned him, and was overjoyed when the man told him that though no launch had come into Payton that morning, he had about three-quarters of an hour earlier seen one crossing the bay from the south and evidently making for Torquay. Quivering with eagerness, Shane once more started up his bicycle. He took the three miles to Torquay at a reckless speed, and there received his reward. Lying at the moorings in the inner harbour was the Enid. Leaving the bicycle in charge of a boy, Shane stepped up to a group of longshoremen and made his inquiries. Yes, the launch there had just come in, half an hour or more back. Two men had come off her and had handed her over to Hugh Lay, the boatman. Lay was a tall, stout man with a black beard. In fact, there he was himself behind that yellow and white boat. Impetuous though he was, Shane's knowledge of human nature told him that in dealing with his fellows, the more haste frequently meant the less speed. He therefore curbed his impatience and took a leisurely tone with the boatsman. "'Good day to you,' he began. "'I see you have the Enid there. Is she long in?' "'About arf an hour, sir,' the man returned. "'I was to have met her,' Shane went on. "'But I'm afraid I have missed my friends.' You don't happen to know which direction they went in? Took a cab, sir. Taxi. Went towards the station. The station? That was an idea at least worth investigating. He slipped the man a couple of shillings, lest his good offices should be required in the future. And hurrying back to his bicycle was soon at the place in question. Here, though, he could find no trace of his quarry. He learned that a train had left for Newton Abbott at 3.33, five minutes earlier. It looked very much as if his friends had travelled by it. For those who are not clear as to the geography of South Devon, it may be explained that Newton Abbott lies on the main line of the Great Western Railway between Paddington and Cornwall, with Exeter twenty miles to the northeast and Plymouth some thirty-odd to the southwest. At Newton Abbott, the line throws off a spur, which passing through Torquay and Paynton has its terminus at Kingswear, from which there is a ferry connection to Dartmouth on the opposite side of the river. From Torquay to Newton Abbott is only about six miles, and there is a good road between the two. Shane, therefore, hearing that the train had left only five minutes earlier, and knowing that there would be a delay at the junction waiting for the main line train, at once saw that he had a good chance of overtaking it. He did not stop to ask questions, but leaping once more on his machine, did the six miles at the highest speed he dared. At precisely 4 p.m., he pushed the bicycle into Newton Abbott Station, and handing half a crown to a porter, told him to look after it until his return. Hasty inquiries informed him that the train with which that from Torquay connected was a slow local, from Plymouth to Exeter. It had not yet arrived, but was due directly. It stopped for seven minutes, being scheduled out at 4.10 p.m. On chance, Shane bought a third single to Exeter, and pulling up his collar, pulling down his hat over his eyes, and effecting a stoop, he passed onto the platform. A few people were waiting, but a glance told them that neither Price nor Lewisham was among them. As, however, they might be watching from the shelter of one of the waiting rooms, he strolled away towards the Exeter end of the platform. As he did so, the train came in from Plymouth, the engine stopping just opposite where he was standing. He began to move back so as to keep a sharp eye on those getting in, but at once a familiar figure caught his eye and he stood for a moment, motionless. The coach next the engine was a third, and in the corner of its fourth compartment sat Lewisham. 
Fortunately, he was sitting with his back to the engine, and he did not see Shane approaching from behind. Fortunately also, the opposite corner was occupied by a lady. As had Price been there, Shane would unquestionably have been discovered. Retreating quickly, but with triumph in his heart, Shane got into the end compartment of the coach. It was already occupied by three other men, two sitting in the corner seats next to the platform, the third with his back to the engine at the opposite end. Shane dropped into the remaining corner seat, facing the engine and next the corridor. He did not then realize the important issues that hung on his having taken up this position, but later he marveled at the lucky chance which had placed him there. As the train proceeded, he had an opportunity, for the first time since embarking on this wild chase, of calmly considering the position, and he at once saw that the fugitives' moves up to the present had been dictated by their circumstances and were almost obligatory. First, he now understood that they must have landed at Brixham, Peyton, or Torquay, and of these, Torquay was obviously most suitable to their purpose, being larger than the others, and their arrival therefore attracting correspondingly less attention. But they must have landed at one of the three places, as they were the only ports which they could reach before he, Shane, would have had time to give the alarm. Suppose he had lodged information with the police immediately on getting ashore. It would have been simply impossible for the others to have entered any other port without fear of arrest. But at Paynton or Torquay they were safe. By no possible chance could the machinery of the law have been set in motion in time to apprehend them. He saw also how the men came to be seated in the train from Plymouth when it reached Newton Abbott. And here again he was lost in admiration at the way in which the pair had laid their plans. The first station on the Plymouth side of Newton Abbott was Totnes, and from Torquay to Totnes by road was a matter of only some ten miles. They would just have had time to do the distance, and there was no doubt that Totnes was the place to which their taxi had taken them. In the event, therefore, of an immediate chase, there was every chance of the scent being temporarily lost at Torquay. These thoughts had scarcely passed through Shane's mind when the event happened which caused him to congratulate himself on the seat he was occupying. At the extreme end of the coach, immediately in advance of his compartment, was the lavatory, and at this moment, just as they were stopping at Tainmouth, a man carrying a small kit bag passed along the corridor and entered. Approaching from behind Shane, he did not see the latter's face, but Shane saw him. It was Price. Shane took an engagement book from his pocket and bent low over it lest the other should recognize him on his return. But Price remained in the lavatory until they reached Dawlish, and here another stroke of luck was in store for Shane. At Dawlish, at which they stopped a few minutes later, his vis-a-vis -vis alighted, and Shane immediately changed his seat. When, therefore, just before the train started, Price left the lavatory, he again approached Shane from behind, and again failed to see his face. As he passed down the corridor, Shane stared at him. While in the lavatory he had effected a wondrous change in his appearance, Gone now was the small dark moustache and the glasses. His hat was of a different type, and his overcoat of a different colour. Shane watched him pause hesitatingly at the door of the next compartment, and finally enter. For some moments as the train rattled towards Exeter, Shane failed to grasp the significance of this last move. Then he saw that it was, as usual, part of a well-thought-out scheme, Approaching Tainmouth, Price had evidently left his compartment, almost certainly the fourth, where Lewisham sat, as if he were about to alight at the station. Instead of doing so, he had entered the lavatory. Disguised, or more probably, with the previous disguise removed, he had left it before the train started from Dawlish, and appearing at the door of the second compartment, had attempted to convey the idea almost certainly with success, that he had just joined the train. A further thought made Shane swing across again to the seat facing the engine. They were approaching Starcross, 
Would Lewisham adopt the same subterfuge at this station? But he did not, and they reached Exeter without further adventure. The train going no further, all passengers had to alight. Shane was in no hurry to move, and by the time he left the carriage, Price and Lewisham were already far down the platform. He wished that he in his turn could find a false moustache and glasses, but he realized that if he kept his face hidden, his clothes were already a satisfactory disguise. He watched the two men begin to pace the platform, and soon felt satisfied that they were proceeding by a later train. They had reached Exeter at 5.02 p.m. Two expresses left the station shortly after, the 5.25 for Liverpool, Manchester, and the North and the 542 for London. Shane sat down on a deserted seat near the end of the platform and bent his head over his notebook while he watched the others. The 525 for the north arrived and left, and still the two men continued pacing up and down. For London, thought Shane, and slipping off to the booking hall, he bought a first single for Paddington. If the men were traveling third, he would be better in a different class. When the London Express rolled majestically in, Price and Lewisham entered a third near the front of the train. Satisfied that he was still unobserved, Shane got into the first-class diner further back. He had not been very close to the men, but he noticed that Lewisham had also made some alteration in his appearance, which explained his not having changed in the lavatory on the local train. The expressway was very fast, stopping only once, at Taunton. Here Shane, having satisfied himself that his quarry had not alighted, settled himself with an easy mind to await the arrival at Paddington. He dined luxuriously, and when at nine precisely they drew up in the terminus, he felt extremely fit and ready for any adventure that might offer itself. From the pages of the many works of detective fiction, which he had at one time or another digested, he knew exactly what to do. Jumping out as the train came to rest, he hurried along the platform until he had a view of the carriage in which the others had traveled. Then, keeping carefully in the background, he awaited developments. Soon, he saw the men alight, cross the platform, and engage a taxi. This move also he was prepared for. Taking a taxi in his turn, he bent forward and said to the driver, what the sleuths of his novels had so often said to their drivers in similar circumstances. Follow that taxi. Ten bob extra if you keep it in sight. The driver looked at him curiously, but all he said was, Right you are, governor. And they slipped out at the heels of the other vehicle into the crowded streets. Shane's driver was a skillful man, and they kept steadily behind the quarry, not close enough to excite suspicion but too near to run any risk of being shaken off. Shane was chuckling excitedly and hugging himself at the success of his efforts thus far when, with the extraordinary capriciousness that fate so often shows, his luck turned. They had passed down Prade Street and turned up Edgware Road, and it was just where the latter merges into Maida Vale that the blow fell. Here, the street was up and the traffic was congested, both vehicles slackened down, but whereas the leader got through without a stop, Shane's was held up to give the road to cross traffic. In vain, Shane chafed and fretted. The raised arm of the law could not be disregarded, and when at last they were free to go forward, all trace of the other taxi had vanished. In vain, the driver put on a spurt. There were scores of vehicles ahead and a thousand and one turnings off the straight road. In a few minutes, Shane had to recognize that the game was up and that he had lost his chance. He stopped and took counsel with his driver, with the result that he decided to go back to Paddington in the hope that when the other taxi had completed its run, it would return to the station rank. He had been near enough to take its number, and his man was able to give him the other driver's address in case the latter went home instead of to the station. Having reserved a room at the station hotel and written a brief note to his sister saying that his business had brought him to London and that he would let her know when he was returning, he lit his pipe, 
and turning up the collar of his coat, fell to pacing up and down the platform alongside the cab rank. He was relieved to find that vehicles were still turning up and taking their places at the end of the line, and he eagerly scanned the number plate of each arrival. For endless eons of time he seemed to wait, and then, at last, a few minutes before ten, his patience was rewarded. Taxi Z1729 suddenly appeared and drew into position. In a moment, Shane was beside its driver. Ten bob over fare if you'll take me quickly to where you set down those two men you got off the Cornish Express, he said in a low, eager voice. This man also looked at him curiously and answered, Right you are, Governor. Then having paused to say something to the driver of the leading car on the rank, they turned out into Prade Street. The man drove rapidly along Edgware Road, through Maida Vale and on into a part of the town unfamiliar to Shane. As they rattled through the endless streets, Shane instructed him not to stop at the exact place, but slightly short of it, as he wished to complete the journey on foot. It seemed a very long distance, but still the man kept steadily on. The town was now taking on a suburban appearance, and here and there vacant building lots were to be seen. Presently, they passed an ornate building which Shane recognized as the tube station at Hendon, and shortly afterwards the vehicle stopped. Shane got out and looked about him, while the driver explained the lie of the land. They had turned at right angles off the main thoroughfare leading from town into a road which bore the imposing title of Hopefield Avenue. This penetrated into what seemed to be an estate recently handed over to the jerry builder, for all around were small detached and semi-detached houses in various stages of construction. Many were complete and occupied, but in scores of other cases the vacant lots still remained, untouched save for their to-let building signboards. Leaving the taxi in a deserted crossroad, the driver signified to Shane that they should go forward on foot. A hundred yards further on they reached another crossroad, the place was laid out in squares like an American city, and there the driver pointed to a house in the opposite angle, intimating that this was their goal. It was a small detached villa surrounded by a privet hedge and a few small trees and shrubs, evidently not long planted. The two adjoining lots, both along Hopefield Avenue and down the crossroad, Alwyn Road, Shane saw its name was, were vacant. Facing it on both streets were finished and occupied houses, but in the angle diagonally opposite was a new building whose walls were only half up. Thrilled with eager anticipation and excitement, Shane dismissed the driver with his ten-shilling tip, and then turned to examine his surroundings more carefully, and to devise a plan of campaign for his attack on the enemy's stronghold. He began by crossing Alwyn Road and by walking along Hopefield Avenue past the house, while he examined it as well as he could by the light of the street lamps. It was a two-story building of rather pleasing design, apparently quite new and conforming to the type of small suburban villas springing up by the thousands all around London. As far as he could make out, it had the usual rectangular plan, a red-tiled roof with deep overhanging eaves and a large porch with, above it, a balcony, roofed over but open in front. A narrow walk edged with flower beds led across the forty or fifty feet of lawn between the road and the hall door. On the green gate, Shane could just make out the words, Laurel Lodge, in white letters. So far as he could see, the house appeared to be deserted the windows and fanlight being in darkness, after the two vacant lots was a half-finished house. Returning presently, he passed the house again, this time rounding its corner and walking down Alwyn Road. Between the first vacant lot and Laurel Lodge ran a narrow lane, evidently intended to be the approach to the back premises of the future houses. Glancing round and seeing that no one was in sight, Shane slipped into this lane and, crouching behind a shrub, examined the back of Laurel Lodge. It was very dark in the lane. Presently it would be lighter, as a quadrant moon was rising, 
but for the moment everything outside the radius of the street lamps was hidden in a black pall. The outline of the house was just discernible against the sky, though Shane could not from here make out the details of its construction. But, standing out sharply against its black background, was one brightly illuminated rectangle, a window on the first floor. The window was open at the top, and the light-colored blind was pulled down, though even from where he stood, Shane could see that it did not entirely reach the bottom of the opening. Even as he watched, a shadow appeared on the blind. It was a man's head and shoulders, and it remained steady for a moment, then moved slowly out of sight. Stealthily, Shane edged his way forward. The back premises of Laurel Lodge were separated from the lane by a gate, and this... Shane opened silently, passing within. Gradually, he worked his way round a tiny greenhouse in between a few flower beds until he reached the wall of the house. There he listened intently, but no sound came from above. If only I could get up to the window, he thought. I could see in under the blind. But there was no roof or tree upon which he might have climbed, and he stood motionless, undecided what to do next. Suddenly, an idea occurred to him, and full once more of eager excitement, he carefully retraced his steps until he reached the lane. It ran on between the rough wire palings, past the two vacant lots, and behind the adjoining half-finished house. Shane followed it until he reached the half-completed building, and then entering, he began to search for a short ladder. Every moment, the light of the rising moon was increasing, and after stumbling about and making noises which sent him into a cold sweat of apprehension, he succeeded, partly by sight and partly by feeling, in finding what he wanted. Then, with great care, he lifted it into the lane and bore it back to Laurel Lodge. With infinite pains he carried it through the gate, round the greenhouse, and past the flower beds to the house. Then, fixing the bottom on the grass plot which surrounded the building, he lowered it gently against the wall at the side of the window. A moment later, he reached the slot of clear glass showing beneath the blind and peered into the room. There he saw a sight so unexpected that in spite of his precarious position, a cry of surprise all but escaped him. End of chapter 5